Hotepu, dear brothers, and welcome to the beginning of your training on fractals. We're going to jump right in, and I want to begin to prepare you with the key terms you'll be learning in this DVD. You'll be learning a few glossary words, such as complicated, complex, self-similarity, emergent order, scale invariance, fractal myths, and fractal geometry. These will be the key words we cover in this DVD, and they will form the core to the test you receive on this DVD. Now, you have attached to this email a document. And let's take a look at this document. It starts on page one, complicated versus complex. These are two very important distinctions to know from the very beginning. Let's dive in. If you scroll to page two, you see the word complicated with an image of a man whose head is filled with these clockwork gears. Complicated refers to a kind of math that deals with Cartesian logic. It deals with step-by-step -step type of thinking. In this image we have the gears where one gear clicks to the other gear and then the next to the next and it's very sequential very A to B, B to C, C to D. It's what we call Cartesian logic and it deals with how to study mathematically a thing that's made of two basic parts. In other words, in this image you're seeing there are the gears which have an open part and a part sticking up and each gear slips into the open part from the other gear. So this type of thinking which you learn in school 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 4 is 8 is a kind of thinking that is useful for mechanical devices. The core understanding of complicated systems, complicated structures, is that they are basically made of two things interacting in a cause and effect relationship. So, A hits B, B hits C, C hits D. This you've learned in school. Now, if we were to take this kind of thinking to its ultimate end, you end up on the next page, page 3, which is an image of a man being taken over by the Borg. The Borg were these characters in the Star Trek series who became total machines. They became biological machines. And if one continues to think in a complicated way of a logical A to B, B to C sequencing, you will end up becoming a Borg, a machine. And many mythologies of the white culture, the Western culture, has that as a dream, as a fantasy. If you look at the future that white culture sees for itself, you look at Star Wars, you look at their myths, their movies, their stories of the future, you always see something of a city on a planet far away that's super technological with billboards and souped up machines, and it's an advanced version of our modern tech world. You begin to see people, the earth, the environment and things as machines and you lose your humanity because the Borg lost their humanity. They just became these drones and they lost the human heart and the human spirit. So this image actually is the inevitable result of Western educational systems. We go now to page four and we see this very complex machine. It's the same concept of building technological advances, lifeless machines that are very efficient. And don't get me wrong, I love 
the modern machines. I love my computer, I love my car, I love the fact that I have running water. And those are all the fruits of complicated mathematics. But I want to make the distinction here of not getting carried away with that being the be-all and end-all. Real life is not lived in a complicated way. Real life has blood and flesh. It has spirit and soul. Things that no computer, no Borg, no math equation can quite catch. So enjoy our technical advancements, but know their place and know their limits. On the next page five, we have a picture of dominoes falling. And this is a very good mnemonic device to understand exactly how complicated math works. One thing hits the other, hits the other, hits the other. And a default position of complicated mathematics is that it's linear cause and effect. That means I can predict what's going to happen absolutely. Here in this image, you know if you hit the first domino, then that will hit the second one, which will then hit the third one, which will hit the fourth one. You know which will fall in which sequence, and pretty much which direction they're going to fall in. It's very predictable, very rote, very mechanical. And the benefit of this is that you can create engines like for your airplanes. And you know, if this tube goes here, and this combustion engine goes there, and I turn them on, I can rely upon it flying me safely through the sky. So you do want to have your complicated things in life, your complicated tools working and predictable. That also allows you to repair them because you can see exactly which small part of this system, this unit, is malfunctioning. But again, great for technology, great for machines, not very good for the human soul or spirit. Next, we scroll down to page six, which shows a man making a business strategy. Now, he's approaching this from a complicated way. He's saying, okay, I'm going to form a hierarchy of activities and objectives, and I'm going to have one at this higher rank this is the most important, then this feeds into that, and then the next into the other. It's the exact same thing as dominoes falling, or gears clicking. It's a very A to B, B to C, linear way of thinking. And it does have merit. But more importantly, it has many flaws. He even has, in this particular one, a box that says, Innovate. Now what's interesting is about innovation, is it does not happen in a logical sequential manner. It just kind of erupts. It just kind of appears out of the blue. You just innovate spontaneously. So he's trying to box in a function of life that by nature does not like being boxed in. So you see here, by staying in this complicated way of thinking, you try to tame nature. You try to tame the spontaneous spirit of the human. And you think that this way of boxing things in actually works. It's actually true to reality. Now we scroll down to our next image, which will be on page 7. And we have here another idea about business plans and how the executive corporate world, how corporations try to program you. Going to school what I call going to the Borg, is basically programming you to become a consumer. Programming you to become a cog in the wheel, a machine, a unit in the great machine, Politico. And here we have this image of a business plan, and look at it. It has this arrow, green arrow going up, implying ascension, hierarchy, going to the higher ranks. It's a step-by-step -step process because each figure is on a stair, so it's very sequential, very logical and linear. And most striking, this image looks stressful. It looks straining and unpleasant. 
And that is true, that when you live a complicated life, where you try to make everything logical and fit into your little boxes, and you become somewhat OCD about things, everything in their place, nothing can be moved, you lose the fullness, the roundness, the smoothness, and the irregularity of real life. Real life has got a sloppiness and a messiness to it and a spontaneity and a fluidity to it. But corporate thinking, white cultural thinking, does not like to deal with the rough edges of life. It wants everything in a little box, a little category. And we'll soon see why white culture is this way. Now, this image on page 8 of the evolutionary sequence according to white culture, we do not view evolution from the white point of view in Africa. It's a very different paradigm. But we're looking at a complicated mindset. And the white culture is a complicated culture. Here in this model, we have a sequence of evolution from the apes to the ultimate conclusion in modern days is the supersizer, the guy with his big supersized Dairy Queen cup of soda, which is probably killing him. But you see here again a linear progression. Now, this is a Darwinian model and the root of this model actually comes from the Bible. The Bible is the mythology of Christians. It's their book of their mythology and their worldview. And the first book is called Genesis and describes how their God made the world. When you study that text, you learn that God, Yahweh, the Christian God is clearly a complicated God because he creates the universe in a step-by-step -step linear sequential way. On the first day there was the chaos, the dark void. On day two, let there be light. And on day so-and-so the animals were created. And on day so-and-so they were named. And then Adam was created and Eve was created. And then it was good. So we have a precise beginning and an ending. And it goes in sequence, A to B, B to C, very linear. And there is a sense of superiority along the way that it climaxed with humans. That Adam, who is a white male, is the climax of creation. And I'm using the phrase white a lot because I must, because we must keep it real. Not all people see it this way. Most people of color, Native Americans, Africans, Polynesians, they don't see it this way. And this concept of creation starting from a point and ending with a white male laid the foundation for terrorism racial terrorism, what many call enslavement, slavery. If your God creates life and ends it with a particular form, which happens to be male and happens to be white, that allows the followers of that mythology to imitate their God's behavior. So if you are white and male, you are the supreme climax of creation. Everything else is behind you in this evolutionary sequence. And Darwin fed into a very stringent racist point of view. And a lot of the Western world that was after Christianity based their racist terrorist policies, calling them heathens, savages, barbarians, if you weren't like them, weren't like the white male, you were barbaric. And even Aristotle, who was before Christianity, said this. He said a free man is only a rich, land-owning, white, male, Greek citizen. Rich, land-owning, white, male, Greek citizen. That was the 
climax of creation and everyone else should serve the rich white citizen land owning Greek male. This is not a theory. This is actually what Aristotle wrote in his politics. So you can see the dangers of having a complicated philosophy where it can lead. It leads you to becoming a Borg where you assimilate other cultures. The Borg were actually terrorists, much like the people of the Inquisition, much like the people who burned the witches. They went and they terrorized other cultures and absorbed them. And that can only happen if you have a paradigm of superiority, inferiority. Now we're going to go to the next image which shows another play on this evolutionary theory but I thought it was fun and humorous. It shows white man starting as a monkey and ending hovered again kind of crouching monkey style at a computer and this is where it seems the white people's culture of technology is leading us to and certainly we're regressing back <laughs> through technology. It's a very humorous and I think telling satire. We now go next to this very important image of this drawing of the brain hemispheres. And we're getting now into what makes a person complicated in thinking. Here we have the left and right brain hemispheres. The left brain hemisphere is the brain that generates complicated thinking. It is the sequential, linear, cause-effect way of thinking. It puts everything in a box, in a cubicle. It's OCD, obsessive-compulsive. It likes everything in a controlled place. No sloppy lines, no blurry things, no airy-fairy, no spirituality. If I can't see it, if I can't measure it, if I can't weigh it, it doesn't exist. And that's how white scientists think and people that follow the white cultural paradigm of science whether you're black or Hindu or whatever you are if you're following the white people's way of thinking about science then you're following a complicated model the danger of complicated models besides the terrorist and racist and Borg like results that are inevitable is it likes to separate from things. It likes to show how things don't link up. And it cannot multitask. It can't process much at all. So you'll find when you get involved in complicated religions, for example, they become very reductionist. They reduce life down to just a few simple buzzwords, like God is good, or praise Jesus homosexuality should not be. They reduce it down to very childish, unsophisticated tags, headlines. Because complicated cannot deal with more than two things at the same time. It cannot multitask. When that brain is working by itself, we call this the brain of evil. All evil, and I am not exaggerating, all evil from the Golden Beetle cosmological point of view is based upon a person living in a hyper left brain way separate from the right brain. The right brain will soon learn, as you're seeing here, is what we call the green brain, the fertile brain. It's holistic. It shows connections. It's an inward brain, brain of meditation, art, creativity, things that you have from within you. The left brain is external, what I call the external culture. The right brain is the internal culture. The left brain relies upon things outside of itself, tools, guns, machines. The right brain relies upon things within itself, inspiration, talent, creativity. The left brain can only know what it is taught 
consciously. The right brain can know unlimited information intuitively without being taught. So I repeat, evil is living through the left brain and pushing the right brain away. So, the reason for the Borg, for all the machinery we have, for our technology that the white man has produced, and white culture, and there were other peoples of different races that did produce inventions, but it all happened within the paradigm of modern white civilization, is because white people are left-brainers. Their culture, looking at the evidence, reflects those who are controlled by a, a right-brain predominance. Whereas Native Americans and Africans and Polynesians are, by looking at their culture, a right-brain people. They're more holistic, they're more inward, they're more spiritual, they're more religious, they're more into trance, they're more into visions, into calmness and peacefulness, and inward development. So I'm defining cultures based upon the brain hemispheric emphasis. It's the only way to make the study of race and cultures scientific. You gotta ask culture A, B, C, and D which hemisphere controls them each predominantly. Our next image is an iteration of this idea, the left and right brain functions. You see again here in the left brain there are images of Warcraft armed men with machine guns shooting people because that brain disconnects from life, disconnects from people. I am one domino, you are that domino, we are not the same domino, I must come to knock you over, it's that way of thinking. But it's not mysterious. It's very understandable if you know the structures of the human brain. But again, the end result of living a complicated lifestyle is death, destruction, and war. In a word, evil. And here this right brain is shown as an artist and people creating things that happen spontaneously and organically. Moving on, we have our final image for this section, which is a brain, a man's head, filled with gears. This is again a play on the Borg idea that we define, let me be clear by we, white culture and complicated cultures define intelligence, being a brain, by being complicated. If you are good at disconnected facts, data, bits of information, if you are logical and sequential, if you are emotionally, let's say, retarded, but intellectually sharp, what they call a true nerd. No social skills, no emotional development, but you're really logical. In a complicated culture, that's called intelligent. But in many other cultures, that's called evil, and that's called an idiot. And we don't want to support idiotic culture. So, how do we avoid that? Well, we move on to our next image. Complexity. Complexity. Complex refers to systems that contain more than two parts interacting at one time. Anything that's made of more than two parts that has simultaneous interactions are called complex systems. So your car engine, the airplane engine, your schooling in Western white culture, those are all complicated systems, complicated structures. Complex structures would be your body, it's made of more than two parts, it's got organs, livers, spleen, nerves, blood. A rainstorm is a complex system an ocean, a forest, 
your kitty cat, your family is a complex system, your soccer team, the crowds at a tennis match. You see you have more than two things interacting at once. And that kind of interaction is far beyond the powers of a complicated mindset. A complicated mind cannot predict that if you have your family having a winter solstice celebration in December, that one member of the family might receive a vision that heals someone else in the family across the country. I mean, you just can't predict that happening. You can't predict when a system is complex what's going to happen as of now. You will predict it as I teach you more this complexity theory in the future. Africans are masters of predicting complex systems. But that's an advanced conversation. Let's keep it focused on the simple part now, the beginning. So, you are complex. When you walk out of your door to go to work, you enter a complex system. You got cars and wind and temperature and other people and traffic and many parts interacting at once. Multitasking, multitasking, multitasking. And things don't happen in a linear way. They happen all at once and it's unpredictable for the most part. It just kind of happens. So you're walking, drinking your coffee and all of a sudden a car almost hits you. Now you couldn't have thought that out logically that if I'm walking the street it just kind of happened, caught you off guard and was a spontaneous emerging moment. I like to refer to complexity as is this a smudge on my window? Here on this image is an impressionist painting. You see complex means something may happen in your life and it seems meaningless. But as you go on you realize looking in hindsight that one little coincidence was actually a small mosaic in a much bigger picture. It was only after you began to zoom out from the moment, you, time passed, and you look back and you saw the whole thing kind of playing out. You say, oh my goodness, what I thought was just a random coincidence was the beginning of a whole new pattern in my life. So it seemed like a smudge on your window, your windshield. But as you pull back, you say, oh my god, that smudge is actually part of a picture. That tiny blue mosaic tile is part of thousands of mosaic tiles, which when I zoom away and look at the big picture from a sky view, that one tile was part of something bigger. This kind of surprise at the order of your life is called complexity. It's called also chaos theory. What's interesting about that phrase is chaos theory does not describe chaotic activity. In fact, it's the opposite. Chaos theory says things look chaotic at first glance, but as you look at it from a bigger point of view, there was an order the whole time. So chaos theory says nothing is chaotic. It just looks that way in the beginning, but in time you will see it was part of a bigger mosaic, part of a larger pattern but you could only see a small bit of it because you were thinking with a complicated point of view. So in this beautiful painting, it's made up actually of small dots, small tiny strokes. And imagine if you zoomed in towards the water and you just zoomed in and you narrowed your view to a tiny blue brushstroke in the water. And that's all you saw. You would say, what the heck is this? Is this a smudge on this canvas? And then someone says, well, step back. And you zoom out. Oh, there's more blue. Oh, well, there's blue in a zone of purple. And oh my goodness, there's oranges. And as you start pulling away, 
the picture gets clearer and clearer and clearer. That's complex perception. It's saying, I will trust this small little event in my life. And perhaps this event is the beginning of a new mosaic. Perhaps it's the first stroke of an impressionistic painting that I have not yet fully seen. I have not yet framed. I'm not sure what it's a picture of, but I'm going to trust that there's a meaning to this little stroke in my life, this little event. It's part of a bigger plan. Is that a smudge on my window? Now we move into the main concept of complexity, which is self-similarity. Self-similarity means that in a complex system, which is two or more things multitasking together, having rich interrelationships, feedback looping into each other in a rich current of relationships, that each part resembles every other part. It's called similar but slightly different, a phrase you must memorize. Similar but slightly different. Here in this beautiful male peacock, who could be a drag queen any day of the week, because only a male drag queen knows how to dress like this, this peacock's plumes are totally fractal. Fractal meaning complex. It's a complex pattern. Look at it. Each feather is similar to the other ones, yet slightly different. Each design, like the little eyes on each feather, are similar to all the other eyes, yet they're each unique and slightly different. The grass he's standing on, each blade, is similar to every other blade, yet slightly different. So you see, this is complex. This is more than one part interacting, but when you look at a complex system, you begin to see patterns. And the patterns you will see are that the parts all look similar to each other, yet slightly unique, slightly different in their own way. This becomes a very important theme as we move into fractals. Our next image is the image of this cauliflower broccoli. Now this is perhaps the most amazing example of a complex system, a complex structure in the vegetable kingdom. Okay, let's take a look at this carefully. Complex means you're going to start seeing patterns in a system that are self-similar, meaning the small parts all resemble each other and they resemble the whole. So you look at the whole cauliflower, it's shaped kind of like an iceberg, kind of like a triangle with a roundish bottom. So you have one big kind of iceberg shape. And then you have these larger nodules, which also have a triangular shape to them, similar to the big one of the whole cauliflower. And then on each of the big protuberances, you see rows of little cauliflowers. They're all the same shape. They're very similar, just getting tinier at the tips and getting bigger as you swirl around each nodule. So you're seeing the sh same shapes mirroring each other on different sizes. This is a prelude. I'm going to begin to tease you with the next phrase down the road here, which is scale invariant, meaning although it's getting smaller, the shape stays the same. It means it mirrors the same shape on different scales, different sizes. No matter how tiny or how big, any part of this cauliflower we look at, the tiniest part looks like the biggest part, the biggest part looks like the tiniest part, the middle parts resemble the tiny, they all look alike. It's like a kind of twinning. Everything looks like everything else, with a twist, slightly different. Our next image is this fern. Take a look. The same thing. It's a complex system made of more than two interacting parts with rich feedback loops. And look, the whole shape, if you were to outline the whole fern from tip to the base, 
has kind of a fern shape. Then you see along the rib of the fern these leaves fanning out. Well, each of those larger leaves each look like the big leaf. And then on the larger leaves there are tiny little leaves. And they look like the middle size leaf that they're on and they also resemble the whole shape of the plant. So you're seeing here the same shape mirroring itself over and over and over. It's a kind of repetition of shape. The forms are similar on every level. So the big leaf resembles the middle leaves which resemble the tiny leaves. That's called self-similarity. A very important concept as we move along. Now here we have an African village near the Congo called Ba Ila and this village is a fractal. It is a complex village. Complex means the big shape is mirrored in all the little shapes inside of it. And the little shapes all mirror each other and the big shape. So, the top photo is the actual aerial shot of this village. And then a fractal mathematician, a complexity mathematician, then plotted this village into his computer to generate a fractal math formula. And you're seeing three images beneath that. One a gray image with a single line in the middle, a kind of open circle. That's the main pattern, what's called the seed fractal, the seed image. And you'll see this open circle with a dash occurs again. In the next image, we're in the middle, kind of top of middle, you have an open circle with a dash surrounded by a bunch of open circles with dashes. And at the bottom, the open circles are smaller and they're growing like the leaves of the fern, like the cauliflower triangles. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but they're maintaining a similar look. It's like twins that keep getting bigger. And then in the third iteration, the third image, you have the same theme of the half the open circle with a dot, dosh, dash in there. And then let's take each of the circles on the edge, now have circles surrounding them. So you have circles within circles within circles. You keep repeating the pattern. This is called a rhythm. Boom, 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 boom. Rhythm. Complexity is a rhythmic science. It looks at rhythms, which are patterns. And so if I were to sing that rhythm, boom, 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 as a whisper, then a little louder, mezzo forte, boom, 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 then forte, boom, 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 boom. It's the same pattern, just bigger in volume. So I sang to you a fractal. I was singing in fractal form, in chaos theory, in complex singing. Our next image now. Let's take a look at self-similarity at work in nature itself. Here we have an image of brain coral. Now it's your turn to start playing. What do you think this resembles? What is it self-similar to? Well, if you flip to the next image, a brain. It looks like your brain. And your brain, as you see on this image sliding down, resembles walnuts. So we are seeing a brain coral, which a shaman would say, who is complex, because all magic, all spirituality is a right brain event, and the right brain is the complex brain. It thinks in complexity, chaos theory, fractals. So a shaman would say, hmm, that big thing in the ocean reminds me of something, reminds me of the brain. Well, they both remind me of walnuts. Hmm, 
I wonder if there's a link between them. On the next page we have a picture of the intestines. And look! They resemble both the brain and the walnut and the sea coral. So you're starting to see a kind of logic. That's why I didn't use the word logic for the left brain. The left brain, the complicated logic, is sequential linear logic. But the right creative brain also has its kind of logic. It's the logic of patterns. It spots patterns very quickly and says that things in nature speak a language of patterns through self-similarity. So to the sorcerer, to the shaman, to the magician, there is a communication, a language happening between brain coral, brains, walnuts, and the human intestines. They're speaking some kind of language to each other of patterns. And so he would say they have some kind of link. There's some kind of mysterious force that designed them similarly because they have something in common beneath the surface. They share, we would say, a similar chi, a similar magic a similar voodoo. Now look what I just did. I jumped into a conversation very mystical. But it's not illogical within its paradigm of complexity. Complexity says all complex systems will have self-similarity as their feature. And then the magician, the shaman says, well, I wonder if and how Things that look alike are actually linked on deeper levels. The next image is that of a cross-section of the testes, your testicles. Take a look. They resemble your brain. They resemble walnuts. They resemble brain coral. They resemble the intestines. You see, many people say, for example, you have to think with your gut. That sentence is actually shamanic. It's actually complex. It's saying that there are ways of thinking that are similar. The brain has a way of thinking, and so does the intestines, and they happen to look alike. Similar, but slightly different. So you have gut thinking, and you have brain thinking. And some people say most men think with their balls. That the penis has its own way of thinking. And if you look at it fractally from a complex eye, well, the pattern inside of the testicles is very similar to that of a gut, similar to that of the brain, similar to walnuts. So it makes me wonder, if I'm a shaman, I wonder if walnuts help thinking. Does it help my thinking intellectually? Does it help my gut thinking? Does it help me to think clearer sexually? And you can begin to see that a medicine man, a root doctor, will start to wonder, is there a medicine hiding in walnuts that affects the thinking systems, whether there is emotional gut thinking, mental thinking, or sexual thinking. It's very logical in its own way. And our next image is of a very famous root called High John the Conqueror root. And they resemble hairy balls. And the voodooists in the New World saw these plants. They said, my goodness, they resemble the balls of a very hairy, hairy man, a man full of testosterone. And they used, looking at the symbol, the visual of it, it looks like a macho man's balls. I wonder if that visual also expresses itself through its power. And lo and behold, these seeds were used as a major seed in the freeing of the slaves from the white terrorists in the South. That's why it's called High John the Conqueror. High John referred to a, an African god called Shango. Shango 
is a very manly deity. He's very macho. And he's a king and he takes no mess. So they call these Shango's balls. And what I want you to see here is how magic, sympathetic magic, and putting certain things in your concoctions and mixtures has a logic if you're thinking with complexity science. There is no linear causal connection between High John the Conqueror seeds and freedom from terrorism. There's no link logically between those two. There is no logical link between walnuts and how clear you can think. So a complicated brain says that's foolishness. That's hocus pocus. What are you doing? That voodoo? That mumbo jumbo? But I tell them, well, you are a complicated idiot because you think your way of thinking is the only way of thinking. At least I know. There are at least two ways of thinking. Complicated and complex. From a complex logical base. These resemble hairy balls of a macho man. I wonder if I burn them or crush them into a powder and I dust an area up. Will it trigger through sympathetic resonance, through overtones, machismo out of the people that inhale it? Hmm. Let's try it. And that's how shamans did their scientific research projects, which, by the way, you all will be doing on your own. When I first moved to Atlanta, Georgia, from New York, I had never seen this plant called kudzu. I've never seen it up north. I came here and I saw in the springtime and summer this plant taking over everything. It just grew everywhere. Because I am a high priest, a shaman, I thought, hmm, I'm observing the behavior of this plant, its pattern. And this plant grows fast and furious and it takes over. I wonder if I add this new southern root, new to me, into my mixes, into my roots, will it grant me the voodoo to take over something, to enter an organization and be able to take over quickly, to spread influence in it fast? Guess what? Yes. The only way I knew that was through complex thinking. So you all too will start to discover things and begin to make your own rituals and potions and concoctions based upon complexity. Next we're going to move into this page that shows a famous rhyme, row, row, row your boat. We're going to move now into auditory patterns, sonic patterns. Now, the song, as you know, is row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. And you sing the song, and you sing the first verse. Then someone sings the second verse as you continue your first one. Then someone sings the third verse as the first two keep going. You see, it is what's called iteration, repeating. It's self-similar. It's a round. So the first voice sings through then the next person sings in and you're saying the same words and the same melody slightly differently at a different point of time. So here we have music manifesting as a complex structure. It's got more than two factors. It's got notes, it's got pitch, it's got timbre, it's got tempo, so it's complex. Yet each part of it is similar to the other part, slightly different. Self-similar. Now, we can move on to a verbal fractal, which you can call poetry or rhyme in particular. It reads, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Jack jumped over the candlestick. You hear nimble, quick, candlestick. That rhyme is a repeating of a pattern a sonic pattern, a word similarity. Nimble, quick, candlestick. They all sound the same to you but slightly different. And by putting it in that kind of rhyme, it triggers your right brain and puts you in a trance. You go internal. 
you start thinking and feeling and imagining more. If I said Jack was running very fast, and he was quite agile, and he began to salt over a stick made of wax from the African killer bee. Now, that may all be the same thing as this rhyme, but you saw how you got bored, you separated from me as I was speaking, you were like, oh, he, what is that? You did not want to engage to connect with it because I took you left brain. And left brain hates to connect, loves to disconnect, loves to not feel just to be dry as bones by the book, like a banker, unemotional, follow the rules, toe the line, Pink Floyd's the wall. That's the left brain world. But to get you creative and stirred and inspired, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candlestick, I began to speak to you in a complex way. The next poem. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn, cauldron bubble, eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork, a blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. From Shakespeare. You see, you heard a pattern repeating, a pattern repeating, like the peacock's feathers. A pattern repeating, a pattern repeating, like the grass blades, a pattern repeating, like the cauliflower, like the fern. It's all complex, and I'm wanting you to start to get an eye for this, because once you start to see that life is complex, meaning a fractal, you will see it everywhere, everywhere around you, even in your own self. You have a mother, women give birth to children who look similar to her. They have two arms and two legs and a head. We give birth to fr little baby fractals. And even born, you may have your father's eyes, your grandmother's smile, and your uncle's way of walking. It's a pattern repeating in your genetics, in your psychology, in your ancestors. And we're going to soon dig into how ancestral communion in Africa, the honoring of the ancestors, is the honoring of a pattern that you are a part of. You are born out of a pattern of behaviors and feelings and experiences. And by honoring your ancestors, you're saying, I respect my root patterns. But that's another DVD soon to come to you and me. I'm getting very excited about the complexity speak, speaking in rhythms and poems. Okay, the next word we have here is emergent order. Emergent order. This is another feature of all complex systems. Basically, it means that patterns will pop up spontaneously, that in a complex system you will find patterns and structure and order coming out of nowhere from within the system itself. The patterns bloom out of nowhere. There is no one entering the room enforcing a pattern saying you do this and you sit there and you say that. There is no director telling the pattern what to do. The system itself grows the pattern from within itself. And you can never see it coming. You can never have predicted that that could have made that pattern. For example, we have here a flock of birds. Look at this amazing image. There are tens of thousands of birds in this image. There's no way in high waters you could have thought that them tens of thousands of birds can make this shape. And not even the birds themselves were thinking it. They weren't thinking, well, today let's go flying out, you know, go, let's fly west and make this shape. It just happened. But it's beautiful, and it's miraculous, and it's stunning. 
this could not have been predicted in a complicated way. You couldn't have said, well, bird A and bird B and bird B and bird C and bird C and bird D. You couldn't lay it out logically. You couldn't see it coming. But you're glad that you did see it. So beauty comes out of nothing. It just appears in complex systems. Our next image is another image of, look at this one. Again, tens of thousands of birds forming a new pattern. What's interesting about this one is it resembles a big bird. How fractal is that? How complex is that? Like the cauliflower, like the fern. The tiniest part resembles the next size part and the whole resembles the parts. So we have tens of thousands of birds making a giant bird shape. This is complexity at its finest in nature. And again, there's no way the logical mind could have said, I can predict this is going to happen. You can't control this. That's why logical left-brainers don't like complex creative people, because you can't control them. And being gay men, the sexual energy is complex. It's a very complex energy. And that's one reason why the heterosexual, I call them crickets, because their philosophies to me are very crooked for the most part as a culture. The crickets can't control us because we're so sexual. Sexuality is creative. It's spontaneous. Erections are spontaneous. When you get hot over someone, it's spontaneous. You can't control it. So one reason why a lot of heterosexual straight men, crooked men I should say, try to control gay communities is because heterosexual crooked behavior is very much a male way of acting, a hetero male way of thinking, a left brain. The men, males are more left brain as a rule. Females are more right brain. Gay men are both brains with a leaning towards the right brain. So you can't control us. Stonewall was not predictable. It erupted spontaneously. Let's look at a few more images of emergent spontaneous, or look at this one. It's like a giant funnel. Tens of thousands of birds swarming. Who would have seen this one coming? The beauty of complexity is astounding and never ceases to amaze. Next we have a school of fish forming a geometric circle, a ring. Look at that. How beautiful is that? As if they designed it on a math board. Here we have a ball of fish resembling a planet, a sun, a ball. It's amazing. But this happened spontaneously. Each fish did not sit down with their pen and paper and design this. They simply allowed the pattern to emerge spontaneously. And here we have an image of this kind of cone shape, this V-like shape of these fish. In the next image, giving you an example of the exquisite beauty of complexity. Complexity is life, because life is made up of more than two parts interacting at once, simultaneously. So, this marks the end of part one of this series on the complexity science. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll go more in depth with scale invariance and fractal geometry. And may you now start to look around you, look at the forest, the trees around you, even your rug, each part of your carpet, although it's not a living thing, is fractal. Each part resembles the other parts, yet they're each different. We are all humans, similar, slightly different. We're complex, we're fractals. So may you look around you and see that you are surrounded in the exquisite complexity of nature's fractals. Be well. Dwao and Hotepu.